My name is Nathan Kimmins, and today I'll be reading The Drop from the Sad Icelandic Fairy Tales by Steingrimur Gudmundsson, available on Amazon Store, and I'll be reading from my Kindle Paperwhite. <clears throat> the Drop The Drop was a boy born in a village deep in the forest where people lived in peace and harmony with nature. It was a unique civilization that had developed for hundreds of years. Mother Nature provided all that was needed to survive. That was the essence of it all. Respect for Mother Earth was a priority. And when a tree was cut down, the whole population would do a prayer and participate in an honor ceremony for the tree. No outsiders were allowed in the forest society, and no one from the outside world knew of its existence. To find it, one had to cross three rivers and climb three mountains. The path to it was well hidden in the canyons and mountain paths. Nine simple rules applied for all citizens. Give your fellow citizen all the good things in life that you received. Pass on your experience. Accept all things as they are. Share with your neighbor when in need. Greed is never acceptable. Never get upset about the past, present, or future. Respect Mother Nature. Respect all human beings. Anyone that did not honor this code was exiled, never allowed to return. This was how it had been for ages, an untroubled society, at least for the most part. Any difficulties that arose were dealt with by the wise council. The Drop had two sisters and two brothers. The family lived in a two-story wooden house, one of the finest structures in the community. He had lived all his life in the forest and had never ventured away. It was not customary for the forest people to travel to the outside world. The Drop was a curious boy and sometimes did not accept the answers he was given. He had an insatiable thirst to know more about everything. What was out there? Who lives in the outside world? Who are the others? Why was he not allowed to cross the rivers? The Drop was the son of a carpenter, unsurprisingly often referred to as the carpenter by the local residents. But his father's real name was Deodar, the Divine Wood. His mother, Amar Amaryllis? Amaryllis? Huh? Uh, Amaryllis? Yeah, wait. Yeah. Amaryllis. Amaryllis? Yeah. What is it? Amaryllis. Amaryllis, okay. His mother, Amaryllis, the sparkling one, was a master weaver. She weaved the most astonishing objects from only the finest material. Her weaving was popular for weddings or birthday presents. It was so popular, in fact, that she was often unable to keep up with the demand. Her weaving generally involved her using her cherished loom, which had been meticulously handcrafted by her husband many years before. An outstanding piece of work it was. As a young boy, the drop was fascinated watching his mother's fingers fly between the threads. With the loom, she interlaced two sets of threads at right angles to each other. The warp, which ran longitudinally, and the weft that crossed it. One warp thread was called an ant, and the other was called a pick. As is typical in a loom, the warp threads are held taut and in parallel to each other. For the drop, Seeing his mother's smooth and graceful movements on the loom was like watching an artist perform. The Drop was a good student in school. In addition to his exceptional reading skills, his teachers were astounded with his beautiful, unique handwriting. And like his father, a master woodworker he had become. A true handyman that could repair anything. People in the village loved him, loved to have him work for them, for his craftsmanship was superb. He was a good storyteller, too. 
He had the gift to compose an intriguing tale on the spot. He brought joy everywhere he went with his smile and bright eyes, for he had learned the true spirit of the forest people, despite his restlessness for the unknown. He was named the Drop in honor of the beautiful droplets that could be found in all forms of water. Dew drops, drops on a leaf, drops of rain. The drops of rain make a hole in the ground, not by violence, but by falling gently. Drops of the river. He learned the wood craftsman skills from his father. An ancient custom, a trade was passed down from father to son, and was often done through several generations. Deodor was skilled in constructing all kinds of things and buildings, all made from wood. He had expert knowledge of the materials he used and was particularly skillful with his hand tools. His workshop was big and well ordered. His son shared the space with him and practically grew up there. In the forest society, the people only used wood material for all buildings and furniture. Porcelain was made from ceramics and pots from iron, all handmade. One day, out of the blue, the drop started to work on a mysterious large object. He worked tirelessly for months and months. In the beginning, he did not even know exactly what he was making. But as the thing developed, he knew this would become his destiny and would change his life. But he kept these thoughts to himself. People asked every day about his new creation, but the drop had no answers. When the time comes, I will have answers, he would reply politely. How he got the idea was unclear. Some said it came to him in a dream. It was as if his body followed some higher force. His movements were automated somehow. He just kept on making this strange wood piece. A big piece, I might add. He used only the finest materials available in the forest. Maple, for what he called the curved back. A variety of different spruces for the front and ebony for a long segment that was sticking out of the object. This piece seemed to be vital, so he spent lots of time polishing it and called it the neck. And there was a frame or sides made from spruce that connected the bottom and the front. His father did not ask much about what it was he was fabricating. He was a kind and patient man so he did not interfere with this adventure even if the boy was using his finest materials. Nor did he think it was strange in any way. He supported his son in all things as much as he could. So, when the drop asked him about gut from an animal to make strings, he was not surprised. This was not an easy task though, for the forest people did not kill animals. So, it had to come from an animal that died from old age. And so it happened that, after a few weeks, he was given guts from his uncle's beloved horse. After patiently waiting for the gut to dry, he made beautiful tuning keys from extremely rare ivory to attach the strings. The strings were highly vulnerable to changes in humidity and temperature and would break easily, so he made as many as he could. Giant loot! That is what this is, his father said one day, when the mystic object was in its last stage of construction. What an instrument! It's almost as big as a small boat! Never had such an instrument been seen before in these parts of the world. Musical instruments that the forest people knew were mostly various types of intricately carved wooden flutes. There were also a few lutes around and some hand drums made from goat skin. These instruments were generally used for the forest society's traditional music consisting of peaceful melodies and positive lyrics. In the old days, the men would sit by themselves, leaning hidden, unseen, against a tree in the dark of night. They would make up their own special tunes, their courting songs. As this new fascinating object was taking its final form in the family workshop early on a foggy spring morning, Deodar said to his son as the sun was beginning to rise, What a marvelous piece of craftsmanship! 
Let's show this wonder to the wise council, for he was extremely proud of his son. I will show it to them when it's ready, and when I can find its voice, said the drop. Fair enough, fair enough, his father said with his characteristic, kind, accepting voice. The last step in the process was to varnish the giant loot. For that he used resin or gum varnishes consisting of a natural plant or insect derived substance dissolved in a solvent called spirit varnish, a substance that had been used for hundreds of years. After applying the varnish, the instrument took on a deep reddish brown color. In a few days, the varnish was dry, and there it stood in his workspace, a beautiful, mysterious instrument that he knew would shape his future. He started to play on it. At first, not much sense came from it, but in a week, he managed to get deep, thick tones from it. Bass notes. And even a melody. He realized that he would not be playing in traditional feasts with it. But who knows what would happen. Finally, he was ready to show it in public. His parents arranged an event in their lovely home, or a feast, rather, for there was an abundance of food and drinks for all the guests. Fresh apple cider, goat cheese, freshly baked breads, fruits and vegetables of all kinds. The council arrived first, four older men and three women. The council was chosen every ten years by the whole population. The number of members varied depending on the importance of the matter at hand each time. They all stared speechlessly at the amazing instrument. What a fine piece of carpentry this is, they all said. You are a true carpenter. The drop smiled and was happy. Soon more guests arrived, all curious to see the wonder of the village. It was a great day. Everyone paid the drop endless compliments for his unusual creativity. Then, in the midst of the festivities, the drop made an unexpected announcement. He said that he intended to travel to the other sides of the rivers, to the unknown, with his new masterpiece. I want to give something to the whole world, he said, bursting with pride. That is my vision and destiny. That is, if the council and my parents will agree, he added with serenity. His mother and father, and everyone else for that matter, were shocked to hear this, and for a moment there was total silence in the assembly. But soon everything went on smoothly again, and people enjoyed the food, presence of each other, and of course the mighty instrument. A few days later, a message came down from the wise council. The message decreed that it was up to the parents to decide about the drop's destiny. So the carpenter family sat down for a meeting and discussed the drop's idea of leaving the forest. Everyone in the family knew he was headstrong and determined, and to stand in his way would be pointless. So the parents gave him permission to go, and his siblings supported him. There was only one promise to keep. With a strange, unfamiliar twinkle in her eye, his mother said softly to him in private, Just come back when you have discovered that you come from paradise. The drop looked at his mother curiously, but said nothing more and gave his promise. And so, he set out on his journey on a fair summer morning. His mother made him a strong bag with straps to carry the instrument on his back. People from the village came to see him off. They brought fruits, bread, and cheese. He hugged his family and walked through town to say farewell to as many as he could. The drop was both sad and happy as he headed into the woods and started his long trip. He was not afraid, for he was on a mission to fulfill his destiny. Whatever challenges lie ahead would surely be dealt with as they come. For two days, he walked the path, surrounded by the forest, wonderful trees that gave him a pleasant vibe. He only stumbled across a few animals on his way, the true residents of the woods, a hare that stared at him astounded, for it had never seen a human being. 
a deer that was unbelievably fearless of him. He had the urge to pet it, but did not. Instead, he greeted it with pleasure and honor, and thanked the higher spirit for a creation of such a delightful creature. While walking through the canyon on the third day of the mountain, the instrument weighed heavily on his back, but it only made him stronger, for when he had climbed the mountain, he would see the river. And what a river it was! It was breathtaking, with clear water streaming infinitely, consisting of endless drops. The drop had never in his life seen such a sight, and when he leaned down to gather water to drink, a stream of delight struck him like some magical buzz. He crossed the river with great caution, lifting the giant loot base high above his head. He knew if the river got too deep, the instrument would be destroyed. After almost losing his footing several times and avoiding the driftwood, he managed to cross without any problems. And when on the other side, he smiled for he felt he had finished the most difficult part of the journey. He sat down by the bank of the river and ate berries. On the tenth day of his journey, he knew he was getting closer. He heard strange noises ahead. They got louder and louder and when he stepped out of the forest, he saw the most amazing thing. In front of them there was a huge black path and endless wagons without horses passing by at great speed. They had bright lights beaming from them. He stood there staring for a few moments, dumbfounded, like a fairy from a tale, which he was, by the way. He realized he had entered the other world. However, he did not lose control and maintained his calm determination. Still, the thought went through his head. Shall I turn back? No. No. I have chosen this path, and I must finish what I have started, he said aloud. So he crossed the big black road without fear, but he had to run to avoid getting hit by the mighty wagons. He entered the city, walking past endless houses. He had never seen so many houses. Houses so close to each other. Outside the houses he saw people cook in their gardens over a roaring stove. He even saw some people swim in their garden. Those houses were big, with three or four wagons outside. The few people he met did not seem to welcome him, but they stared at him for a few seconds. He smiled at everyone he met and saluted them with a bow. After a long, long walk, when arriving it was what was obviously the center of all of this, he saw all kinds of people, black, white, yellow. This was the first time he had seen different kinds of humans. Here in the center, the number of the peculiar wagons rushing from place to place was insane. He had to be extremely cautious not to be hit by them. The high buildings were also a little scary for him. How could they stand so still? There were some green areas in the city. He was amazed to see them. He felt that a plant would have a hard time in such an environment. It wasn't so crowded and he could actually see the sky between the buildings. He liked that. And as the sun was setting, the light hit the buildings in such a way that it had a magical look to his pleasure. He walked by a beautiful riverside walkway. So charming. All in all, he was in a good mood even though everything felt alien to him. He passed people eating and drinking in various locations, inside and outside. People with painted white faces doing theater on the street. A man playing a melody with an odd metal instrument on the sidewalk that was so ravishing it brought a tear to his eye. People were all over the place, walking fast, rushing in all directions with white bags in their hands. The drop was tired, exhausted, and hungry. But then he heard music somewhere in front of him. Music with energy. Lots of energy. His tiredness disappeared in a flash. As he approached the intriguing sound, 
He saw it was coming from an old building next to a well-lit place that looked like a popular gathering spot where people were eating wrapped up food with great lust and haste. He walked towards the sound and entered the building through a heavy glass door. He went into a long corridor down narrow stairs and there it was, a dark smoky basement smelling like a brewery with five people performing music on a stage in front of a small crowd. Three black people and two white. And the music was like something from another planet, wild and free, flying in all directions. Such a wonderful flow, the drop thought. There was a lady sitting by the entrance by a table with several different types of colored paper. She said something to him, but the drop, of course, did not understand her. He entered the room and walked towards the stage. By now, everyone was looking at him, especially the musicians. They stared at this fascinating and exotic person with a contrabass on his back, dressed in a peculiar, colorful clothing. Who could he be? The drop stared back at them in amazement and was glad to see the same instrument as his on the stage, being plucked smoothly by a kind-looking old gentleman with jet-black skin. The band took a break, and the bassist, who introduced himself as Stuart, invited him to join them backstage. Of course, communication was difficult, but with some patience and laughter, the group befriended the curious newcomer. The drop showed them his instrument, and they were duly astonished with the magnificent craftsmanship, especially Stuart. They were eager to hear the instrument and skill of this eclectic character. The instrument was totally out of tune after all the traveling. So after tuning as best he could, the drop played for them everything he knew. Stuart was impressed, but knew the instrument needed new strings. Then it would sound better. He asked where the drop was staying, but of course the drop did not understand the question. But from the looks and the odd conduct of the drop, Stuart realized that this mysterious young man did not have a place to stay. Well, you could stay with me, boy, said Stuart gladly, using hand language to explain. And we can play bass together, he added with a kind smile. Thank you, thank you, the drop replied with deep gratitude in his own language, when he understood what Stuart was offering. The band members were taken aback at this totally alien language. What a wonderfully unique language. The drop enjoyed the rest of the evening in total delight, listening to this wild, free music with great eagerness. He learned a lot that night just from watching and listening. He was given some food at his table, some bread and cheese. The bread was hard and tasteless, and the cheese tasted like dry pepper. But he did not want to be impolite, so he consumed it all with great gratitude. And when the evening was over, the drop went home with Stuart. It did not live far away. They walked from the music venue with their bases on their backs. The leaves were falling and a few snow flurries were swirling around. The fall was announcing its arrival. The drop slept well in Stuart's big flat. He was tired after such a journey. The next morning, they had tea and fresh bread and played together. Stuart had an extra set of the hard, shiny strings, which they put on the forest instrument. And boy, did that instrument sound. So fully bodied with thick, woody tone, and yet still with a subtle, velvety complexity. Stuart loved playing on it. He had never seen anything like this before. As a matter of fact, this was the most beautiful thing he had seen in his life. This instrument would be worth a lot of money, he thought to himself. The drop noticed that his new friend's flat was almost empty. His first thought was that he needed to build some furniture for Stuart. But how to go about it? Where was he to get material or workspace in this alien, fast-living society? On the third day, he was surprised not to see Stuart all day. He was hungry, had not eaten since the day before. He looked for food, but there was none around, so he decided to take a walk. 
He walked the neighborhood searching for trees with fruits or some field with vegetables, but there was nothing like that in sight. In his hometown, people shared food openly, but here, totally different rules applied, rules he did not understand. He went back to Stuart's place and played all day on his instrument. That gave him great pleasure indeed. It made him feel free because he and his instrument were as one. With it, he could go in any direction he chose, create tones that flew into his ears and into the environment around him. The world needs these tones, he thought. These tones are universal vibrations that no one can actually see but can feel, and that's the beauty of it. He was so happy to be able to supply them. At least he had plenty of water. He did not have to go outside to fetch it. It was right there in the flat, and in two rooms. The following day, he went out to try to trade his handbag, a beautiful piece of work that was made by his mother. He traded it to an old man on the corner that had all kinds of things stacked up on his shelves. The drop saw a lot of intriguing musical instruments there. He wanted to look closer, but the old man gave him a mean look, so the drop left the place in a hurry. Before leaving, he gave the old man a bow, for he respected all people, mean or not. The old man took this as disrespect and slammed the door of his pawn shop right in the drop's face. But for the bag, he received a few pieces of the colored paper that he had seen at the music place where he had met Stuart. He was able to trade it for a couple bags of fruit and vegetables to a kind old lady near Stuart's flat. Four days later, Stuart came back one morning. He did not look well at all. Stuart went straight to his room and locked the door. The drop was worried. And in the evening of the same day, he was gone. Later in the same evening, there was a knock on the door. The drop opened the door, and in front of him stood an angry old lady. She screamed at the drop loudly. He just stared at her in silence and smiled nicely. Of course, this made her even angrier. He did not understand the angry lady at all, but she kept using the same two words, pay and rent, which he did not comprehend at all. The drop was starting to have second thoughts about his trip. He seemed to constantly encounter anger and anxiety which was virtually unknown to him. And when he went to sleep after a little bit of playing on the instrument with the new steel strings on, he still felt sadness in his heart, a strange and unwelcome feeling. The next day, he woke up. His instrument was gone. After a brief moment of confusion, he actually realized that he was overjoyed with happiness. Somewhere, someone was enjoying his instrument, creating music. He had brought a good thing for the world, and that was good enough for him. Then, his mother's words struck him like lightning. It was time to leave. It was time to go back to paradise.